Hi, this is Mr. Guy, and we're going to be looking at Congress. We're going to be looking at committees, caucuses, and how a bill becomes a law. It's just a brief overview. There will some be crash course videos that are going to go over a little bit more detail about the different committees and um, how a bill becomes a law. But this is a nice, good overview for this. So here we go with Congress in action. So Congress convenes and begins every two years on January 3rd of every odd number of years. So the new Congress that's going to be elected in basically November will start January 3rd, 2021. House has formal organization meetings at the beginning of each term because everybody is elected every two years when everybody is up for re-election. The Senate, because it's a continuous body, only one third is up for re-election. Two thirds are already and won't be reelected, has few organizational issues to address to the start of each term. When Congress is organized, the president presents a State of the Union message to the joint session of Congress. This message basically is required by the Constitution, and it is given in Congress, and it's in January. Um, sometimes it might be in February, depending on different needs and uh, what's happening in the world, but it's typically what's going on in the world and how the state of the United States is doing. There are presiding officers in Congress. There's the Speaker of the House, which is the most important person in the House of Representatives and is the third ranking person in our government. And then you have the President of the Senate, um, who is not that important. It's actually the Vice President of the United States is the President of the Senate, but has the little power. Um, so you got the Speaker of the House, who currently is Nancy Pelosi. The Vice President and the President of the Senate is um, Mike Pence. The Speaker's main duties revolve around presiding over the House and keeping order. The Speaker selects members of all select and conference committees, signs all bills and resolutions passed by the House. The President of the Senate has many duties as the Speaker of the House, but cannot cast votes on legislation. Typically, they vote in case of a tie. The President pro tempore, E-E-M-P-O-R-E, is the leader of the majority party. It's elected by the Senate and serves in when the Vice President is not there. And typically, the Vice President, you know, Dick Cheney was there once a week. Um, Joe Biden was not there every day, depending on what was needed. Um, I'm not sure how often Mike Pence goes there, but the President Pro Tem, the uh, leader of the majority party, that would be Republican, would be the um, taking the place of the Vice President when he's not there. The party caucus, each party, the Democrats and Republicans, have their own closed meeting and members of their party in which they deal with matters of party organization. There are floor leaders. Um, they are party officers are picked for their post by their party colleagues. So you'll have the majority leader, minority leader, um, and they're in each, the House and the Senate. And then you have whips. They assist the floor readers, and they basically serve as a liaison between the party's leadership and its rank and file members. They count votes. They see how many votes are up for a bill. They will tell the uh, leaders whether it's going to pass or not, or whether it's going to be close or what they think and who they need to twist their arm and get some people there. So the whips are for each party. There's majority whip and minority whip. And then there are majority leaders and minority leaders. And it all depends on who's in control of the House and Senate. So right now in the House, the Democratic Party um, is in majority, the minority is Republican Party. In the Senate, the Senate is controlled by Republicans. So the majority leaders and majority whips are Republican and the minority are Democrat. Let's get confusing. The chairman are members of committees who head the standing committees in each chamber of commerce. Congress, sorry. Each chairman of these permanent committees is chosen by the majority party of the majority party caucus. So if you're in the House, all of the chairmen are Democrat. If you're in the Senate, all of the party chairmen are Republican. Typically, there's seniority rule, an unwritten custom that holds the most important posts will be held by those party members with the longest record of service in Congress. The head of each committee is often the longest serving member of the committee from the majority party. So typically, if it flips like it did in the House, the minority leader, the minority chairman in that committee became the majority chairman in that committee when it flipped and so on. So they stay there. It's the seniority rule and the, major the chairman is chosen by the majority party. Here's the composition of Congress. So you see that there's 235 Democrats, 199 Republicans. And then you have 45 Democrats, 53 Republicans, two independents. 
So you, you have that makeup and you can see there's more Republicans on the Senate side, more Democrats on the, on the House side. Now, there are committees. Most of the work is done in Congress in the committees. The standing committees are permanent panels in Congress of which bills are similar in nature and could be sent. Most of the standing committee uh, handle bills such as dealing with particular policy matters such as foreign affairs, veterans affairs, banking. Um, you might have a standing committee that's about um, agriculture. The majority party always holds the majority of the seats on each committee. The lone exception is the House Committee on Standards of Official Conduct. Um, but typically, the majority party always holds a majority of the seats on each committee. There are standing committees. These are permanent. And then you also have select committees. And here are some permanent committees of Congress. You see this House Standing Committees, Agriculture, Appropriations, Armed Services, Budget, Education, and so on. Senate Standing Committees, Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. So it's a different name, but same idea. Appropriations, they both have appropriation committees. Armed Services, Banking, Housing, Urban Affairs, they both have a budget. So you see the difference. There's a few more in the House than in the Senate. There are 20 House Standing Committees. There are 16 Senate Standing Committees. And Joint Committees of Congress are Taxation, Printing, the Library, and Economic. Then we have the House Rules Committee and Select Committees. House Rules Committee is only in the House, decides whether and what conditions the full House will consider a measure. It has basically determines the rules of the debate, rules about any amendments, rules about how long the debate's gonna be, it can speed up, delay, or even prevent votes. Select committees are panels or committees that are to handle a specific matter for a usually limited time. So they're temporary. Most select committees are formed to investigate a current matter. One, there was, I think, eight or nine select committees on Benghazi to research Benghazi and look up what happened at that time. So these were select committees for a specific purpose. And then after the purpose was done, they disbanded or stopped. Joint committee is one of members of both houses. Example of joint committee is joint economic committee, the joint committee on printing, joint committee on library of Congress. A conference committee is a temporary joint committee. It is a body created to iron out the differences between two bills passed by the House and Senate. So they are a house that was a bill that was passed by the House, a bill that was passed by the Senate, but they're different. There's different wording, different text, different information. And this conference committee gets it together and they iron out the differences because both bills have to be identical. So a conference committee is a temporary joint committee of both party members, and it's there to iron out the differences of the bill. So they're identical. How a bill becomes a law. This is the first steps. A bill is proposed to the House or the Senate for consideration. Both the House and Senator must um, basically introduce the bill. A bill or resolution usually deals with a single matter, but sometimes a writer dealing with an unrelated matter is included. Writer typically goes on a bill that is popular, then the writer is not popular, so it kind of will get passed with that. The clerk of the House numbers each bill, gives a short title, ends or enters the bill into the House Journal and the Congressional Record for the day with the actions that's going to be taken and what committee it goes to. Typically, it's HR 1 for the first bill for that session. And then um, so you have HR 1, HR 2, HR 3, and that's House of Representatives Bill 1, 2, 3. Types of bills and resolution. A bill is a proposed law or draft of a law. Public bill applies to the entire nation. Private bill only applies to certain places or people. A joint resolution um, is a proposal for action that is a force of law when passed because both houses passed it. So it's joint. It, it has the effect of law. Deals with a special circumstance or temporary matters. Concurrent resolution is a statement of position on an issue used by the House and Senate acting jointly. Does not have force of law. Does not require present signature. In a resolution, again, is relating to business of either house or expressing opinion on a matter, does not have the force of law, does not require a signature. There be, could be resolutions naming something or um, saying that, you know, they condemn uh, the president or they condemn Russia or they condemn China for something or what they might feel that needs to be done. So these are the different types of bills and resolutions. Bills in committee, and most of the work is done in committee. Um, most bills die in committee. They're pigeonholed. That's the name for dying in committee or put away. It's never acted on. 
If a committee pigeonholes a bill that a majority of the House wishes to consider, it can be brought out of committee by a discharge petition. It needs 218 people to vote for it. It's very hard and very rarely is it done, but it is a way to, when the, say, the Speaker of the House and the majority leader does not want to bring them a bill, somebody can get that bill out by getting 218 people to pass it. Most committees do their work through several subcommittees, divisions of existing committees formed to address specific issues. So each committee would normally has a subcommittee. Committees and subcommittees have public hearings. They make trips to different places, like they might go to the Middle East, where they gather information relating to the bill. So they, most of the work is done in committees and subcommittees relating to that bill. When a committee, a subcommittee has completed its work on a bill, it returns to the full committee. The full committee may do one of several things. Number one, report the bill favorably with a pass recommendation. Number two, refuse to report the bill. Number three, report the bill in amended form and change it, mark it up and make it different. Number four, report the bill with unfavorable recommendation. Number five, report a committee bill. And remember, most bills die in committee and they just don't report the bill. But those are the five options that the committee has after subcommittee returns the bill. Scheduling a floor debate. A bill is placed in, the, in this is in the House only, five calendars before going to the floor for consideration. Calendar of the Committee of the Whole, the House calendar, calendar on the Committee of the Whole House, the Consent calendar, the Discharge calendar. So a bill is placed into one of these calendars. Before most measures can be taken from a calendar, the Rules Committee must approve the the steps and time it takes for its appearance on the floor. So the rules committee must go into it first. They must see what's going on with the bill and how it's going to be acted before it can go taken from a calendar. Bill on the floor. Committee of the whole includes all members of the House. However, they may sit as one large committee and not as the House itself. When the committee of the whole resolves itself, the speaker generally steps down and another member presides and then general debate follows. Debate. There are severe limits on the debate on due to the House large size. There's 435 members. Not everybody can talk all the time. Typically, it's 15 minutes and they go back and forth. The majority already starts and then they have the majority, then it goes to minority and then they go back and forth with time that they have, like I said, typically about 15 minutes. Typically, the majority leader and the minority leader are the first ones to speak on the bill and then it goes to other people, other people in their party after that. Voting on a bill, there are four methods of taking a floor vote in the House. During the vo voice votes, the Speaker calls for the yeas and nays. Number two, a standing vote. Members in favor of four or against a bill will rise and they're counted by the clerk. One fifth of a quorum can demand a teller vote, in which the Speaker names two tellers for and against, and members pass by each one to be counted. And then number four, you can have a roll call where a roll call may be demanded by one-fifth of the members present. So they basically state how it is. Once a bill has been approved at a second reading, it then becomes engrossed or printed in its final form, and then it's read for a third time, and a final vote is taken. Introducing a bill and rules for debate. Introducing a bill, now this is for Senate, so this is on the Senate side. Uh, bills are introduced by senators. They speak, and they're formally recognized for that purpose. Proceedings are much less formal in the Senate compared to the House because there's only 100 versus 435. Again, it's numbered S1, S2. Rules for debate, there's major differences between that. As a general matter, senators may speak on the floor for as long as they wish, as long as they can. This freedom of debate allows for the fullest possible discussion of matters on the floor, and there is no House Rules Committee that goes in the Senate. There are two things that are basically for the Senate. The filibuster is an attempt to dock the bill to death so it doesn't pass. Senator may exercise his or her right of holding the floor as long as necessary. And basically, in essence, talk until measures dropped, until they decide to not do it. And this was used in passing or trying to pass civil rights. It was used in some military things. And it's just basically used to stop bills from being passed. To stop a filibuster, the standing rules of censure deal with cloture or limiting debate. If at least 60 senators vote for cloture, no more than any other, then it stops the debate, forcing a vote. So 60 senators are needed for cloture. Um, and then basically the, after you have that vote, it stops the filibuster. But it's very hard to get 60 votes to 
stop the vote. Any measure act by Congress must have been passed by both houses in identical form. If one of the houses will not accept the other version of the bill, the conference committee is formed to iron out the differences. Um, once a conference committee completes its work on a bill, it's returned to both houses for final approval. It must be accepted and rejected without any changes. So it's got to be identical. It's got to pass it identical. A lot of times today, instead of going to conference committee, uh, one house, say the Senate gets it second, they must pass the House version or else if they don't, then it goes back to the House and it doesn't get passed. President has options. The president may sign the bill and then it becomes law. President may veto the bill, refuse to sign it. The president can veto, can be overridden by two thirds vote of members in present in each house, which is very difficult to do. So typically once the veto is done, um, they refuse to sign it. Um, basically veto is stopping the bill. Um, it, the bill just ends. If the president does not act upon a bill within 10 days. So say the president decides not to sign it, not to do anything, it becomes law after 10 days. So that to me is a good way of basically passing a law, but you don't want to veto it. You don't feel that strongly. Let Congress do that. A pocket veto occurs if Congress adjourns within 10 days of submitting a bill. The president does not sign it. So say there's only eight days left in the session and the president doesn't do anything, then it dies. It just is a pocket veto happens. So those are the four options a president has when he receives a bill. Um, so the veto will stop it. The pocket veto stops it. And then if he signs it or does nothing and 10 days pass, it becomes a, becomes a law. So that's how a bill becomes a law. Those are the different standing committees, select committees, conference committees, joint committees. Um, you'll see a um, crash course video about committees, and then you also see a crash course about how a bill becomes a law. And this is how most of the work gets done in Congress. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask in class or post below or make comments in classroom.